My name is Fred Roos. I was born at Hall Street, Long Melford, on 27th of September 1912, where my father had a butcher's business. Unfortunately, he died when I was only seven years old, leaving my mother a widow with the four children, the oldest I was the oldest. One, one of my earliest re recollections of my youth, or young, very young age, I, is of a German airship bombing Sudbury during the First World War and of people in the town being killed. Another memory of German prisoners prisoners of war who worked in, on the farms around Long Melford. They used to make wooden toys for we ch children uh, and was, we, we could only repay them in with cigarettes and food. Another memory I started school when I was five years old in a farmhouse which served as an infant school. From there I went to the village school in Long Melford, finally to Sudbury Grammar School when I was ten years old, staying there for the next six years. On leaving school I You joined your mother in the business, didn't you? I cheerfully joined my widowed mother in our family business, which she had been running since my father's death. I had always taken a keen interest in the meat trade, and, and now I was growing up, mother was glad to have me helping. I had my keep plus three and six a week, quite an average wage for a boy in those days. To augment this low wage, I kept pigs on the paddock at the back of the shop where we had adequate lairage and my mother lent me the money to start up this bit of stock rearing. Then after selling the animals, I used to repay the capital. The profit from, I well remember the profit from the first pigs I sold, I made 15 shillings on each, which was uh, equivalent to 75 pence now. I was gradually able to take over more responsibility in the running of the business and in 1939 I got married. My, my mother then moved to the uh, house nearby and so that my wife and I could set up home in the house which Those early, those early war years were far from easy. Meat was so severely rationed so that there was little profit at margin. All slaughtering of animals previously done by, on our own premises was taken over by the government. However, little later on, during the war, I had what we counted a real uh, a stroke of luck. A stroke of luck. I, I gained a contract to supply me to construction workers at Elfeeton Aerodrome, about three miles from Long Melford. This was a welcome boost 
for us, although making very hard work, after, uh, often late into the night, as we were short of staff, and in those days I myself had been exempted from war service due to a leg disability for which I had numerous operations. After the war, rationing was gradually lifted, but the government then imposed many regulations on small traders. Many had neither the capital or space to fulfill these requirements. However, thanks to a legacy from two relatives and the thrift of previous years, I was able to comply with the re re uh, required regulations. So once again, we were able to buy meat uh, 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 bullocks off farmers and slaughter them in our own slaughterhouse. From then on, to build up the business. This is now run by my son. On his ma marriage, he moved out, uh, we moved out of the shop house so that they could live on the premises. Many years ago I bought four old cottages on the Malford Green for £240. These were eventually condemned. They were pulled down and I had my new house built on the site where my wife and I now live. Now, <laughs> you want me to say something to you? <laughs> I'm Phyllis Roos, Fred's wife. I've now lived on Long Melford for 50 years. We actually celebrated our golden wedding last month. So I can now qualify as a true Melfordian, I should think. We have our son and daughter both living in the village. We also have six grandchildren. Back to when we were first married, I took over the office work for the business from my mother-in-law and continued this part this part part time until a few years ago. With the war on, it was then a case of mainly work with little in the way of entertainment. We had no TV and petrol was severely rationed, curtailing the outings which young people now freely enjoy. And a wish drive or dance in the village was a real occasion. Over the last fifty years, as my husband will add, we saw many changes. I declared I would never manage to operate our new electric till, which replaced the old-fashioned cash drawer with the till roll on which one scribbled down items sold. And then, laboriously, all the items on this till roll had to be added up, minus the pocket calculators which the young ones use today. Then there was the switch over from pound shillings and pence to decimal coinage. Again, we declared we would never adjust to this. But of course we had to, and also had to help many of our older customers to understand it as well. Also, with the soaring prices of meat, no longer could pounds and ounces be calculated in our heads. So again, machines were introduced, which both weighed and priced. These mechanical aids are now all taken for granted, and it's only one of those of us who can span about half a century or more who can remember anything different. So carry on. Looking back, over the years, one of the most striking changes I have seen in, is the phenomenal increase in the price of meat. Whereas before the war I could buy a 900 weight bullock for £25, this now costs over 500 As in turn retail prices soared. We found that the average weekend joint got smaller and smaller. The whole trading pattern seems to have, to be altering. I can recall the days too before me mechanical refrigeration, cycling to Kentwell Hall in, in on a trade bike little front wheel and a big carrier, uh, which I used to take out a hundred weight of ice in two 56-pound blocks to, up to Kentwell Hall. 
for this, a uh, Lady Guthrie, who was re residing at the hall, gave me a Christmas box of th 30 shillings. And... Uh, at 150 a day. <laughs> well, yes, that's what I said. 30 shillings, 150 yes. <laughs> This was a handsome amount for a young fellow to receive on the. On the. In the 1920s? 19, in the 1920s. Is it possible that, eh? Yes, I suppose yeah. it is. Yeah, it's under a boy. Where are these. The good old days, in many ways, yes, Comparati comparatively crime-free, with with majority uh, of people content with their lot. In those days, our village seemed more like one large family. Everyone more closely knit. Nowadays, in the village has grown, I cannot help feeling rather sad to see the real old Malfordian families dying out with so many newcomers with so, no real roots in taking their place. Hmm. I mentioned before that we just had our golden wedding and this photograph I'm holding was a, a surprise present from the whole family. Apparently they had some high jinks getting this taken and I think the older boy almost rebelled in the end and, uh, and went off. I, I think it must have been rather tiring because actually um, the man who took it as a, a neighbour of ours, a very good photographer, and um, he took very many photographs, out of which they chose this one to be framed. We went to church on the Sunday morning, back to St Gregory's Church, where we were married 50 years ago on the 22nd of October. When we came back, the children had said they would like to come up and have a drink with us. Well, when we got home, we felt soon afterwards they came with a parcel all wrapped up in gold paper, and we found that it was this photograph which I'm holding, which is something which we very much treasure. They, they took quite a lot of trouble to have it taken, and uh, we've almost got all of them now looking at us. I live at Borley. Red hair, sporty green. Red hair, sporty green. I went to school. No, I was born. Where were you born? So I was born at a thatch cottage. I was born in a thatch cottage. Mm -hmm. I had two, uh, a brother and a sister. I had a brother and a sister. And what what date were you born then? 19, in no, 1900. 1900. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I went to Borley School. What time did you, what day, uh, how old were you when you went to school? I'll say five if you don't know. Do you? I, uh, I was about five when I went to school. And, and I, I went there till, I went there till I was, 13. till I was 13 and then I left. And, uh, and I, went to work on I went farm. to work. As a barker's boy for Mr. Gardner across the lodge. Uh, Did you have to walk to school then? Yeah. Yes, I walked to school. And took your dinner? And there was about 56 of us went to Baldy School. Some from uh, Rodbridge. I. Which included some from Rodbridge. Which included some from Rodbridge and some from Liston. And, um. What lessons did you do? Oh, well, I had all sorts of lessons. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, you read scripture, always, didn't you? Yes, mm -hmm. scripture first, and then I had sums and uh, reading. reading and writing. And um, each of the boys had a garden, didn't they? Oh, you said uh, the boys had a, 
a garden at the bottom of the school. I had one. I used to, I used to dig it up and set it with all sorts of vegetable and few uh, potatoes. <laughs> And what about you, Mother? What time? So when did you? Um, when were you born, and where? And um, I want to. I want to get in uh, about uh, how I hit this man about the head. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. 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 i Another day come along, uh, a man come up the road with a cartload of flour for Mrs. Scribner on the green. On the green. She used to bake the bread. I've got a can fold at the time, and I was shot and hit this man a bag the head. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> said. He come. Somebody said, dared you to do it, and they said, could you knock oh, his yeah. hat off? Oh yes, and uh, he, he come up. He come up. He come up to the schoolyard and and he went and fetched the governess and and we all went down the toilet <laughs> and uh, he come in the playground and and the governor said come out the come out the toilet and we all come marching out the toilet and and he picked me out he said that's that little dark one there was <laughs> he said uh, that's the one look he said that's the one and uh, of course. He went on his journey and come up with the flower, and I had to go in school. I had the cane. And I had the cane. <laughs> I had it two or three times. And she said that you and burned the cane. And she said I had to go. I had to go out. Go home. Didn't go home to dinner. And uh, the next day, I you must well, have said no. I went home and I told me dad and mum that uh, I got to go home to dinner. And she said, "Do you tear enough shoe leather out now? <laughs> you, you can't go home. You can't. You must go to school. Way. You must still go to school." So I took me dinner the next day, and and uh, started eating in the playground. Started eating the playground, and the guns come to the front door, and she see me she uh, in there, and she come after me and got hold of my neck and. <laughs> and me out the, out the, into the rose. Well, when she went back and got out of sight, I went back again. <laughs> and she come, she come and looked again to see if I was in the playground, and and I was. She so she, uh, she come and and again. got me out again. So uh, I made them all to do. I went down to the to the railway hut, which was just down the road, no more than about twenty yards. And uh, there was the railway man who looked after the the hut and the gates. And, the gates. Uh, and then there was uh, Eddie Wheeler and uh, Hope Gardner. <laughs> they were playing cards. They were playing cards. I sat there looking at them and, and I asked them the time and they they said that was... Uh, Wasn't time to go back here. Yeah. Two o'clock. I was supposed to be in school by half past one, so I went. I went racing up to the school and uh, went in. And she said I was late, so I had another cane. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was another time when you had to hold the slates on top of your head. Oh, I, I, I won't finish this yet. Oh, <laughs> so uh, anyhow. I still took me dinner and After and I went out in the playground and and I went out from the playground and into the road and had me dinner and then I used to go down to the hut. But after a time, I got I got back into the school playground <laughs> and uh, well, there was another time when you were um, naughty and you had to hold these slates. Oh yeah. Oh, well, that ain't much, that ain't. Well, it? just to tell that there were slates there and that was what they used to write on, wasn't it? So I was misbehaving once. Uh, I used to stand in the corner. To, I used to hold my sl hold, hold hold the the slates. slates up above my head 
So I made my arms ache one day and uh, I dropped the stakes and the slates and broke them. <laughs> so I didn't have to hold more slates. <laughs> Uh, several, on several occasions I'm afraid I was naughty mm -hmm. and uh, I got into a lot of trouble. I wasn't one of the best of boys at school. <laughs> uh, well, it's all about school, wasn't it? So were you in the choir at the, at the same time as you were at school? Were you in the choir at the oh, church? Yeah. Oh yes, oh yes. I'm, so I ain't going to put that in. I'm going to pull it from there on to the land, Dana. You want mother? Uh, yeah, well, let's let mother know. Um, Me? Yeah, well, you were born where? Well, well St. Catherine's Road on Malford in 1904. Um, well, that's what I've got to say. <laughs> well, you went to school up well, at Well, yes, yeah, I went to school at Long Malford. Um, uh, after I, I don't know how old I was, Mother moved down to Cotton by Lane. And so I wasn't so far from the school, but we had to walk then, you see, up to the school and back. And, uh, well, lessons was uh, more or less the same as him. We had, I always had him and prayers and scripture first, the sums, and uh, reading, writing, spelling, and, and uh, all those things. Um, you did have cookery that was... Oh, we did when we got older. When we used to go down to the lecture hall in Malford. Have to walk down in twos and go down and do cooking. And the boys used to do carpentry downstairs there. And we used to go once a week. We used to play uh, basketball on the green near Malford Hall. That bit of green near Malvert Hall. And, uh. Where are we when you left? Well, I was 14 when I left school. Just as the war ended. The First World War. And so your father was still at the war? Oh, he was still away. He didn't come home in November. The war, I think, finished into September, didn't it? And uh, he came home in November, and I went to work at the corset factory in Malford. But there wasn't a lot of work. No, there wasn't. Well, after I'd been there a time, the work got slack, and uh, we didn't have a bed, perhaps a couple of days' work a, a week. We had to go down and walk to Sudbury for, to the unemployed place, and uh, do six days for nothing, you see. So we didn't ever really get the money out of it because by the time we'd done them before, we'd done them six days, there was some more work coming in. So, so I got fed up. fed up with that. I got fed up with that and I went to service on come to Borley Rectory. And that's where you met Father. And that's where I met <laughs> Alfred. <laughs> yeah, well, you better stop now. Then you yeah. better go on what you did when you left school. From my school days? No, when you left school. Yeah, what are you going to say? From my school days, when I left school, I went on the land. For Mr Gardner? Mm. First of all, I went as a barkers boy to start work. And from then on, I, I went on the land. For Mr Gardner? I went, mm. I went to plough, done all sorts of agricultural work. I went and done ploughing, harrowing, rolling. And at one time you went and looked out of the sheep. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, okay. Drilling. And what did they do with the harvest then? Did they take a harvest and so I, you got... I've done all sorts of work on the land. I looked after horses, pigs. Now, when you was older, Oh, yeah. <laughs> How did they take this harvest? Well, they used to... They used to take a harvest years ago. They used to give you a shilling. And you've got to... You've got to do all the... 
all the harvest till that was ended. For a certain amount of money? Yes, how for much? a certain amount of money. I don't, I don't exactly know how much, but uh, uh, it wasn't a lot, but in them days, uh, we used to see the harvest in, and then... Uh, and you had the money when you finished? Had the money when we finished. Do you know how much money you had when you first started work? Oh, no, I, I forget. I don't know if it was one in about three or four, three or four shillings. Four, four or five shillings. When I, I had about four or five shillings when when I uh, started work, and I ended up with uh, eleven pound a week, going seven days a week. When you were sixty-five. Looking after no, pigs, I I looked after the horses, cows, or bullocks, and and pigs. And I ended up with eleven pound a week, and uh, that was when you were sixty-seven. Yes, and uh, at, the, at the end of my how end much of my time. How much did you get when you married? How time. much were you living on when you married? You didn't get about twenty-nine shillings a week when we married. So you used to give me twenty-three. I often wonder what I done with that. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, you say, we took the through the, when you were in your teens, what did you do? Um, for, uh, yes, and, and Saturday nights. What well, did you do on a Saturday night? Well, we used to walk to Sudbury. Walk to Sudbury. Oh, well, yes. Across the meadows. Walk to Sudbury across the meadows, and first call was at the Plough Inn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we used to walk up the town. And, and did the shop stay open? Like, oh, yes. Yes, the shop, now, yeah. shops was open, and mm. we used to go and listen to the Salvation Army on the hill. on the hill, on the market hill. And uh, if we got the shopping to do, which was very little, uh, <laughs> we used to do it and come back to the play in till ten to, o'clock till they turned out. Used to call it the fish and chip shop. Oh yes, we called the fish and chip shop, Branches. and and we used to have fish and chips. And eat them by the time we got to the play Inn. And what's it day cost? Sixpence? Six, yeah, about. Bit of fish and chips. Uh, the chips weren't about uh, plenty of tops. No. And the fish were about sixpence. Mm. And then you walked back and uh, you never saw this ghost, I think, I suppose. No. Oh, no, we never. <laughs> no, uh, supposed to be a ghost at the, at the rectory, morning. Uh, which is a thing I never did see. I never see no ghost, and I didn't. I'm ninety year old, and I don't. I don't believe it to this day. <laughs> uh, well, then you um, you had a football team. Oh yes, here. Oh boy. When you was in your teens, there was a football team here. Yes. Uh, We, 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 got up a, we got up a football team, and I was in it. Where did you play? On Played Church on, Manor. On Church Manor, near the church. And uh, we used to, at the finish, we had quite a good team. We used to play surrounding villages. Uh, How did you get there? Whoa. Walked to there. No, yeah, um, but other villages when you were playing oh, like we, Magnum. We uh, we used to go in a wagonette, didn't in we? In a horse and horse and wa um, wagonette thing. Wagonette thing. Okay, didn't they? Them days. Yeah. Palmer had a horse and carriage like <laughs> wagonette. Can you remember any of the team, Alf? Huh? Can you remember any who played with you who was in the team? Can you remember? Can you remember any? Yes, you remember. Those. Oh yes, they were still. Fred Farrance. Hmm? Fred Farrance. Uh, there was uh, Nandas. There was Alf. me, Harry Scribner, Ernie Scribner, from Jack Mills from Rodbridge, okay. Joe Barnes, uh, Fred uh, Farrance. Fred Farrance. 
Arthur Pilgrim, uh, Bud Parrish, Elf Parrish. Might be a team, I think. You you've, got, you've done well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell them about the Laudanum game when you were oh, down the street. We also played different villages. We went to Laudanum one day, and uh, old ladies come looking at the door and they say, Oh, look at those little old mites. <laughs> uh, we went onto the ground and we had to kick off at the start, before the march started, and when the march started, the way we went. I went down, they give, the ball was given to me, and uh, I scored a goal. That was the only one and you from, got. And from that time till we ended, I never got another chance. <laughs> uh, at the finish, we lost 13, 13 one. <laughs> Uh, they was a, quite a good team. Uh, 30, weren't they? You put later on, you had the, some Foxhead people, didn't you? La Latterly, yeah. we uh, united them. with Foxhead. Because you lost them. And we got half a team from Foxhead and half from Baldy. So we yeah. landed up with a good team. Mm -hmm. uh, And um, you had a club, didn't you, out here? Yeah. Next door to where you lived. It was a working men's club. Oh, yes. Yeah. We, at night, we used to, we had a, a club uh, uh, where we used to play cards, In the house dominoes, draughts, all sorts of games we played, and we was open till 10 o'clock. Supposed to be 10 o'clock, but uh, on Friday it was a not more. <laughs> was it every every night? The police got here to know we was applying for money, <laughs> and uh, he uh, used to come stood outside out. underneath an old eel tree, a big eel tree. He stood out there and heard we heard we uh, putting the putting the coins on the table. <laughs> so he tapped on the door and and uh, come and asked. What was we doing? And we'd all collected the money up then, <laughs> so the police couldn't get no hold. But if he'd have seen the money, he'd have had us, had us up. <laughs> Used to be people from Malford come up, oh, Theobald. Yes. Uh, Bill Theobald. Bill Theobald used to come up from Malford. Different ones used to come up from Malford because we had certain ones in the football team. Who was the head of this club? Somebody started it, did they? Yeah, it was um, Kiplan. Kiplan. Kiplan, uh, Mr. And Kiplan. And uh, he was the head of the club. He lived at the lodge. And, uh, and him up at Eastern Hall, what was his name? Daniels. Daniels. Yes. Yeah, Major Daniels. Major Daniels. Was, uh, Hall. Him and Mr. Kiplan was head yeah. of the club. Mm. They was. Uh, they well, was mother used to sort of. Uh, mother used to clean us. Clean it, light the fire. Mother used to clean it, have, that was next door, yeah. have uh, quite a little money for doing on it. Mm -hmm. uh, well then what, uh, were you married and uh, when did you take the post office? Well directly we married, we married in the February and we had the post office the 1st of April. And you had it for oh. 30 odd years, 30 32 years, I think, I've had it. Then you had a quite operation, didn't you? Well, yes, so I give it up. But um, I didn't have much money at the beginning. I forgot, but they told me I only had seven and six a week. I, I, I forgot what I did have. No. The postmaster said seven and six a week at the beginning. And we had to pay five shillings a week rent here. That was here, you had the post office here, didn't you? Yes. Here, here in this house. And so we paid that out of that post office money. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because that was a lot of money then, yeah, five shillings for yeah. rent. So yeah. it, was a it wasn't a, they didn't live in a farm cottage, did you? Oh no, so, no. so you were Swiftness next door, oh, you see. So she had the off licence yeah. and used to bake bread for the village. And she was a widow, so she halved the house and left to get this rent, you see. Mm. 
So we had to pay five shillings a week, and, which was a good bet. So we took that out of the post money. Mm. Almost did all the time we had it. You just had Thursday afternoons off, didn't you? Yes, I had Thursday afternoons off because my mother lived at Malvern. I used to go home then. Well, we, we got to where you sort of hmm? come up to Borley Rectory, didn't we? Oh, so yes. you um, worked there. Well, I worked there just on not quite two years. For the Reverend Ball. For the Reverend Ball. And you never saw a ghost? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. No. And uh, I didn't ever see the ghost or hear anything about it. Nobody never said nothing about it, you no. see. So you don't think nothing about it. It wasn't talked it? about till after they'd gone, did they? Well, you see, I went to Brookhouse then. I left there at Malford for the Braithwaite's. And Alf used to come down. He was caught in me, so he used to come down to mine. Well... Well, the night I was out, I don't know what, I didn't always have the same night. But anyway, when he come home, uh, there was a, after Bull died, there was a black parson come here. What was his name? Smith. Smith, was it? Yes, I believe it was. Smith, wasn't it? No, it was Smith. Well, he was the one that put it about, you see, he, he put it in the evening papers. And the people flocked up here that night. Well, every Saturday night, didn't they? Yeah. For a long time, all that summer, and threw bottles through the windows, and <laughs> till he said it wasn't a ghost, that was rats. He said he come out and said because he got frightened. But ever after that, you see people say there is a ghost, don't they? Yeah. You used to hear when you were in bed somebody shuffling along, didn't well, you? Well, we did, but um, we used to think that was the Reverend Bull because he was very nervous. We always used to go round all the doors to see if we locked them and barred them. And so I always thought when I did that, that was him. Went to the church every, every night, didn't he? Oh, yes, he used to go and shut the church up right every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, who did you live with there? Huh? Who did you live with? Oh, um, well, first up was Winnie Piper. Well, she was the only one. And, and how she? did, uh, tell me uh, about... You clean the church, you know, her uh, uh, clean the church. Oh, uh, and Gordon Greenslade, he used to, they had a cow, you see, and he used to milk the cow and <laughs> and always had hot water in a copper. Didn't have hot water like they do today. So he had to light that copper fire every morning and get hot water for me to take upstairs for them to bath, you see, and wash. And he used to milk, have to milk the cow because the Reverend Ball always had a glass of milk from the cow every morning. So we had to get out and, and milk that before I went up with anything. You had to get the fires before they come down? Fire? Did you like well, I used to have to clean the dining room and the study and lay the breakfast, you see, and um, Winnie, she used to have to get the breakfast. She used to have to do the front hall and get the breakfast. She used to have to, he always had bread and milk. Well, I think Mrs. Bull did. And uh, then a fried breakfast after. And we used to, before that, we always used to have to go into prayers. You see, we, he used to sit in his armchair, and we used to sit on two chairs in the dining room. And he used to read a bit out the Bible. And then we used to, have to turn around and kneel down with these chairs. <laughs> Our groom, our groom was on the lawn laughing at him. The guy used to be on the lawn laughing at us. <laughs> Have a giggle. <laughs> and when you had to clean the church? Oh, yes. Then we, we had to clean the church between us. Winnie, the other girl, she cleaned it. She had a half a crown a month. And I had to dust it for God, she used to say. Mrs. Paul, you see. Margaret, she used to call me Margaret, because that wasn't my name. Margaret can dust it for God. <laughs> she couldn't have the money. <laughs> and when she went out anywhere, bridge parts, and then I had to do the flowers. She used to do the flowers if she was there. But uh, and then I left. And he, and he didn't live so very, about another year, did he, after I left? What the Reverend Bull? Well, then you married and come here and uh, kept the post office. For 30 years. And um, what happened in the war, the, this uh, last war? In the war? 
I already know oh, that. Yeah. It's the, well, <laughs> he's left that out, but that doesn't matter to how he was called up in the First World War. But he, he was not quite 18. I, 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 uh, I didn't know So he had six months exemption, and during that six months, that ended. So I never had to go in the So we didn't have to go. I never had to go in the war. But the Second World War, he went in the Home Guard, because he was too old to go to the war. But he went in the Home Guard. He went to Malford first. He went to Malford first. I started at Malford. Mm -hmm. Went to Malford and uh, uh, a little while. And then I was transferred And I was transferred to Bordy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, How many were there? I don't remember. Several. Okay. Yes, they were. You see, because they were all land people, they didn't have to go to the war, did they? Million. Million. Uh, <laughs> 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 Make me think of Rob Walton. <laughs> And, uh, well, there was Fred Farrens, Wilson, and Wilson, oh, yeah, and Albie it. Gardner, and uh, a lot of them, all of them, weren't well, really, weren't they? Two Pines, mm -hmm. Two Pines, and Ted, and who was at Ace and All? Who was a farmer at Ace and All? Fred Farson. Farson? Farson, yeah. There you come, did he? Farson. And, uh, Didn't you have to go one night? to um, Snatcher's Pit. Were mm -hmm. there um, search light there? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I was supposed to take somewhere, weren't you? <laughs> 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 Wilson, he didn't look. <laughs> I went in with the soldiers. They had the, because they took food, they took food with them. And uh, I went in this, with the soldiers and had some of their tea, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Wilson. Wilson made them laugh. I remember, Wilson. He went. He was a comical And player. he was uh, a bit of a comic. He, he, uh, what did he offer to get what he done? He said something about him jam with kept us for breakfast. <laughs> I thought, you know that corner, um, top of Seven Forms Hill, I thought somebody was up on that bank or something. And, oh, I don't know. That's where we was, we we stationed at. Top of Seven Forms Hill. Well, they had so many out, so many in, you see. They had so long to, to watch. Yeah. Then they had to go in and others went out. I didn't have to go in so much as some people because uh, I uh, looked after the horses here. Oh, so, of course, you had time off. Yeah, well, I, I had to go home. I had to come home at a certain time, you see. Mm, they do now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those were left there. Till the morning, you see. But then some of the time you were a fire, fireman, weren't you? Because that's where that chapel come from. <laughs> uh, uh, they they brought the brought the things here. Yeah, pile and pile and the things and 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 shovel. We kept them, didn't we? Yeah. He went to Mrs. Williams to learn about a fire <laughs> in the house, didn't you? Yeah. You and two or three more. They crawled a, a bit on the floor because you mustn't be <laughs> standing up in the floor. <laughs> Didn't you have to go to Foxhurst Village Hall and learn about uh, Thursday? First day. Yes, yes, he, he did. He did. He did. Mm. Oh. From the Home Guard. I, do, I, do, I, wasn't, I wasn't very interested. I didn't take it in much. Who was it? What, what was it? Uh, was, was it the Lambert? Mrs. Lambert? Or Mrs. Yeah, Mrs. Lambert. Yes, took him, I think. Big first aid. Oh, I think we went over to the lodge, the, the women, Mrs. Palmer, yes. Mrs. Payne's mother, she, she, you know, she was a bit of a nurse, when she? Mm. She learned us first aid, you know, to bandage, and we had to bandage each other's heads and things. Well, we had two or three books, we bought two or three books about it mm. during the war. Something that? Yes, if yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh, I never okay. know. Huh? Well, we, we during the time high school was about, we used to have a, we had a matter which was called rookery matter. We went we went there, and when that was when the high was carted, we come along the road, and there's a steep hill. So one person used to have to run up this hill and see if there was anything coming on the count of. Things meeting one another. 
I had to go back, wouldn't I? So they couldn't because they were horses. Horses. Oh, well. so they, we, they was uh, waving at horses. You see, they used to stay at the bottom, and uh, if there was not anything coming, the way they used to travel up the hill. But if there was anything at the top of the hill, they used to let them come down. Look all these to it, isn't it? Mm. Okay. I was in the... Used to be. I also was was uh, a choir boy. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I used to go had to go to church every Sunday morning. There was about oh twenty of us, I think, in the choir. And uh, men and boys. And there's a photo in the Borley Church now. Or? There's a photo in the church today of my my photo on. And the rector and in the, the middle. Hey? The rector in the middle, the Reverend Ball. Yeah, the Reverend Ball in the in the middle. He, his photo. Didn't they give you something on Good Friday? And, uh, mm. and at the end of the, uh, the uh, uh, Christmas time, we always used to have a party, a Christmas party, and and uh, boys had to go alone, and men went alone. Boys and girls had used to have to go alone, and the men men used to have a party. Because they used to... Where was this held? Held at the rectory. This was held at the rectory. And uh, Mr. Alfred Bull, when he, when he come, used to, give come to the rectory... Uh, he used to give him something, didn't he? He used to, he used to uh, present me with a toy. Oh, the boy. And the men had to barker. Mm. Did you have something on Good uh, Friday? Uh, uh, when he was a little boy. When he was a little boy, they used to have to go to church Good Friday, and then they went across to the rectory to have... Oh, Mrs. Ball used to sit at the door. Oh, yeah, with a, bar, with a basket of buns. Yeah, yeah, with a basket of buns. Where'd you eat this? Uh, we had a basket of buns, the old lady Ball. She sat at the door and handed me a bun each. <laughs> so we come along the road and, and uh, well, I eat, I eat half mine. And, thought you'd save and the rest of mother. Thought that was a good I eat that half no, before you, I got home. No, you said you'd save it for your mother. Oh, I think I did. But you kept eating the until we got home. You hadn't got any. <laughs> I kept eating until I, until I finished mine. Albie Gardner wasn't even near the school. He went bowling his down the road. <laughs> Were you, were you confirmed? Oh, yeah, oh, you know, I went to Bournemouth to be confirmed. You had to walk, didn't had you? Had to walk. Old Tom Byford. He, uh, come with he you. come with us and was supposed to look after us. <laughs> and I think we knew more than what he did. <laughs> uh, My name is Frederick William Pawsey. I was born in the village of Alfeton, Suffolk, in the year 1919. And that was a time when the rural communities were, to be quite frank, poverty stricken. Just a few words about that village. It had a population of 183, and I know that because my brothers and sisters we often used to count the population of the village. In those days, Alfeden had a pub, the Red Lion. It had a post office and shop. And it had a school with a population of 60 children. Today, Alfeden has no pub. It has no shop. It has no post office. And in those days, we, if we wanted to go to Bury or Sudbury, we could catch a bus on Wednesday. Mr. Shedd and Mr. Chambers ran buses. And on Saturday and Thursday, we could catch a bus to Sudbury. 
when I was about 10, I was given the opportunity to sit for the, a scholarship at the Sudbury Grammar School. And I always think how interesting it was that I went to sit that exam in a pony and trap. That was the taxi, if you like, for Alfeaton. And it was kept and driven by Jack Simpson, who had lost an arm in the First World War and was the husband of the lady who ran the post office. It is as well to just remind you that this Suffolk village at those days had no water supply, no gas, no electricity, no refuse collection, none of these sophistications at all. Today, of course, it has them all. I've passed this scholarship examination to go to Sudbury Grammar School and to go I had to cycle each day seven to eight miles to get there and at four o'clock seven to eight miles back home and the thing that always struck me was the wind was against me when I went in the morning and for some strange reason it always seemed to be against me when I was coming home. What was a Suffolk boy in a small village to do when he left school, for example? The lads who stayed in the village school almost without exception went to work on the land. Many of the girls went into domestic service. As I was at the grammar school, it was suggested that I became an apprentice in the Royal Air Force. So I went to the RAF school at Halton in 1936. That was a three year course in what to me was on reflection is the finest school one could possibly imagine. I had a happy, successful, marvelous time at RAF Halton, but like every other school, I meet people who hated it. I even meet Etonians who hated Eton. And I meet boys who only went to a village school and hated it. But I enjoyed my time at Halton and I owe it a great deal. That meant that I graduated from Halton in December 1938. And I joined the Royal Air Force proper in January 1939 with 56 Squadron at RAF North Weald. Now, I was with them until the start of the Battle of Britain and then I joined 238 Squadron at Tangmere and during the Battle of Britain I was with that squadron on maintenance at Tangmere, Middle Wallop, Chilbolton, St. Evil, and one or two other airfields. It had always been my ambition to fly. So in having volunteered in 1941, I was sent to America to learn to fly. This was under a scheme called the Arnold Scheme whereby General Arnold offered the opportunity for so many youngsters to be taught to fly in America because the weather was so good. I think his comment was how on earth do you ever teach anybody to fly in with your weather? He didn't know. He said if you come to America 350 days a year are suitable for flying. So I found myself on a ship bound for Canada, uh, then from Canada to Georgia and Alabama in the, where I was with the United States Air Force, who at that particular time weren't in the war. They had a very, very strict course indeed. You only had to make 
some quite elementary mistakes and you were very quickly shipped back to Canada. I just managed to get through the primary part. I was average at the basic and above average at the advanced flying. At least that's what I was told at the end of the course. At the end of the course, the Americans had come into the war after Pearl Harbor and they in turn were short of instructors so six of us had to, vo had to volunteer to be instructors. We were given a very short course on instructing and for six months I was instructing other British people and Americans on advanced flying. At the end of 1942, I came back to England, just before Christmas. And after a brief course to get familiar with RAF procedures, I was sent to North Africa. I took a step during that particular episode of getting married. And it is an interesting thought that my wife came from the London area and was used to gas, electricity, water and everything else and yet as far as she could see if she ever came to me in Alfeton she would have none of those things. But I married in February 43 and not long after I was in North Africa where I joined 253 Squadron which had hurricanes. From North Africa we were then went on to Sicily and Italy, Salerno. From Salerno, by now by the way we had Spitfires. From Salerno to Naples. From Naples we then went to Corsica which had recently been captured back from the Germans and Italians and we were attached to an American group of fighters so I was able to again fly with Americans. While we were there we did attacks on shipping, we uh, intercepted aircraft that were attacking Anzio or somewhere else along the coast and after about six to eight weeks we moved back to Italy at Foggia. At Foggia our main thing developed into helping the partisans in Yugoslavia. Just as a reminder up to that particular time the British had largely been supporting Mihailovic and his Chetniks in Yugoslavia. But those who had been there found that there were some doubts about exactly what that support was. So our support shifted to Marshal Tito and his partisans. It isn't easy to support a group of people who are fighting on the ground with aircraft, dive bombing and strafing, if they don't know how to liaise. So one day while I was sitting in a tent doing nothing, the group captain, group captain Boyd his name was, sent for me and asked if I would go to Yugoslavia one night, being flown into a secret airstrip, take part in a battle with the partisans while my own squadron gave them air support and show them or tell them the best way of doing it. Well off I went to Yugoslavia that night. We landed in a Dakota which was carrying apart from me flour for food and weapons and ammunition and it was an eye-opener to me how quickly they threw the cargo and me out of it and promptly put into the aircraft a large number of wounded to fly back to Italy. The following 
day, early in the morning, we went to the scene of this battle, which was to be an attack on a small town. And the battle was successful. My own squadron came and supported them. And that was satisfactory. Can I have a little rest here? I can see it. The ne after this battle was over, the, 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 this is one of the humorous parts of it, um, one of the Yugoslavs asked me if I could ride a horse. Well now, being a good old Suffolk boy, I had all ridden on cart horses, so I said yes. But when they brought three horses, they were barebacked, they had a bridle and um, so on, but they were fiery horses which I associated with Cossacks. They reared up on their hind legs and these two two Yugoslavs literally leapt off the ground into the onto the back of their horse and they streaked off along a track raising a cloud of dust and the others who were there were waiting for me to jump onto my horse but I had to signify to them that I couldn't jump off the ground onto the back of a horse so they gave me a lift onto the back and then they let the horse go and it streaked off after the other two with me hanging on round its neck and terrified shouting woe the horse didn't understand the word woe being a Yugoslav horse I remembered the word for stop which was stoi and the horse stopped and there I was on a track in Yugoslavia sitting on a horse no one else in sight I had no idea where I was and I wondered well what happens to me now but luckily I persuaded the horse to move again and it carried on along this track on this hot summer morning for about an hour and a half and I came back to the airstrip where the others were waiting for me and wondering why I had been so long. If you've ever ridden a horse bareback for a long time on a sweaty day you realize how sore your bottom gets. So when I got off this horse you can imagine the sight as I sort of stood straddle-legged with a very sore backside while they all laughed their heads off. Their reaction was how can it be that a man who can fly a Spitfire can't ride a horse properly. Well, there I was, and they brought some black, black bread, and we were eating this, and uh, quietly saying amongst themselves, well, we'll wait here till this evening, and the aircraft will come and take him away. I was not known by my name, but I was called Captain Spitfire. While we stood there, on the far end of the valley where this airstrip was, a German convoy of tanks and vehicles suddenly appeared about a mile and a half away and started shelling the airstrip. The Yugoslavs shouted Pokrit, which means literally run like mad, which everybody did, and I followed, and we took off to the mountains. So all the best laid schemes where I was to be gone just for 48 hours had gone. And I was with the partisans in Yugoslavia making sure that we avoided any groups of Germans and goodness knows how long that might last. By a coincidence, after some time, some days, we met a British Army officer who carried a radio and he asked me about myself and he by putting an aerial in a tree could communicate with Cairo and Italy and he let them know where I was and my wife who had been told that I was missing then received a letter to say that I had gone on a special mission and was gone rather longer than had been expected. Eventually, we captured the airstrip back. The Dakota came in one evening 
and flew me and a load of wounded back to Bari in Italy. And then I rejoined my squadron at Foggia. I continued flying with 253 Squadron until about October when I had done a little bit more than what was called an operational tour and it was time for me to have a rest. I'd been lucky to survive. And I went to Egypt and from Egypt I was sent back to England. And if I remember rightly, I arrived back in England, I think it was just before Christmas 1944. And it was at this time, I, the news caught up with me and my family that in fact I had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for my flying with 253 Squadron. After Christmas, the Air Force, who had more pilots then than they wanted, and as I had hurt my leg in Yugoslavia, decided that I ought to take up a different job. So I was trained to go lead motor transport, and I did a course on that, and then went to Belgium, Holland and Germany, the main purpose of which was to take convoys of lorries to take people or, or supplies to various squadrons or units in Europe. This I continued to do until sometime I think about July 1946 when it was time I think to come I was demobilized and I came back to England. I had thought that I might go stay on in the Air Force. But when I um, had a medical exam, it was found that the leg I had hurt was in fact had been broken and therefore I was not really fit to continue in the RAF. I left the Air Force and by now my wife had one child, a boy named Christopher. And the job that was immediately available was to work for my father for a year. And we came, both of us, back to Alfeton into one of those little thatched cottages which had one room and a kitchen downstairs and one room and a landing upstairs. It had no water, no gas, no electricity, no lavatory, proper lavatory, except down the bottom of the garden. And my wife, who had been used to all the sophistications, if you call them that, nobly managed marvellously. She, the, the, I think Christopher was about three, two or three, and or wasn't as old as that. Nine months. And um, she looked after him, cooked and did everything with oil and oil lamps and we lived quite contentedly there. But at the end of a year I stuck to my original idea of going to college to become a teacher. I went to college, my wife had to stay at home and eventually I graduated from there as a teacher. Then came the job of fine finding where was I going to teach. Well, there was a great shortage of teachers and I was quite easy to get a job at Headingham School, Sybil Headingham in Essex, which was about 15 miles from Alfeton. So I bought a motorbike and I, uh, for a year or just over, I went each day to work on a motorbike and home every evening. The headmaster then was a man called Mr. Garden, who is still alive and I still meet him occasionally. And most of the staff were like me, ex-servicemen from the RAF, the Army and the Navy. It was a marvellously run school with about 250 to 300 pupils. 
Now the normal teaching career, you move about from school to school. But I never did leave Headingham School. As soon as I suggested that I might go, the suggestion was put back to me that I could perhaps move up a grade or take on a more responsible position. And the result was that I never left Headingham School. I stayed there and became deputy head of a secondary school and then for three years the head of the secondary school. And its pupil population during that time grew to 850. Then it became comprehensive. I was long in the tooth and it was obvious that a younger man should become the head of the comprehensive school. And a man called Mr Cobb came along to be the boss and I became his deputy. And together we worked the school up to 1,250 pupils on roll. A really hard working, interesting and exciting time. I continued as a deputy head until I was 61 when I decided it was time to retire. I had a tremendous send off having spent some 30 something years at Headingham. I really did have a marvellous send off and I retired from teaching. However, during my time at Headingham School it had been suggested to me that I could perhaps with my experience become a magistrate and I agreed to this and I was accepted and I joined the Halstead bench. Now within a few years the Headingham and Halstead benches combined under their chairman Mr Hall and then in due course I became the chairman of the bench from 1987 to December 1989 and again that was a most interesting part of my life. I think one of the things that persuaded the people who interviewed me that I might be suitable was the fact that during my service career I had had to prosecute, defend and sit on the bench at court-martials of people who had got themselves into trouble. And justice, what, whether it is on a bench of magistrates or in the Crown Court or in the services or even as a headmaster in a school, justice really means fair play. And if you can deal with those who have shall we say overstep the mark fairly and within the law then you can deal with that sort of thing quite comfortably. It isn't everybody's uh, thing to be, to be a magistrate. Now I have been retired from being a magistrate since December last year but what do I still do? Well, my wife has got a list of decorating, for example, already. <laughs> the bathroom is being done at the moment. But I am the chairman of the governors of the village school in Cavendish, which is a very small school. It has about 32 pupils aged from 5 to 9, two teachers and a staff to look after them. And it is a very successful small school. Very interesting to think that some 25 to 30 years ago, well over a hundred children of ages 5 to 14 attended that school. Now, as I said, it's only 32 children aged from 5 to 9. The other thing that I do is to go around East Anglia talking about Suffolk dialect and village history. 
I have two languages. I have English, which I'm speaking now, and Suffolk, which I can lapse into, boy, with no trouble at all. And people are conscious that this dialect, this way of speaking, which was the natural way of speaking as a child to me, is now dying out. The honest truth is that radio and television and communications generally are making us all Angela Rippons and Richard Bakers. And sadly, to many, the old Suffolk way of speaking is dying out. Now, when I walk down Cavendish Street today, and if I meet someone, I say, good morning. Whereas when I was a boy, it was not unusual to hear one man say to another, what, boy? And I'm sure they weren't conscious of the fact that they were using a, Nor a Viking word, boar means man, and whoop was a strange old-fashioned greeting in Suffolk anyway. And the, for instance, when I was a lad, nearly all the motive energy on a farm was horsepower. And those horses did the ploughing. Some farms had a tractor, but most of the ploughing was done by horses. And I can still hear that ploughman saying, Cook, will he? when he wanted his horse to turn right, and Cook, will when he wanted his horse to turn left. And I can still hear that wonderful word, hully, which is used still by many people in Suffolk. If it really rains like it did the day yesterday or the day before, that holy rain, boy. If you don't feel very well, you feel holy queer. And if that snowed a lot, that holy snoo. They're all ways of speaking of my childhood. Today, I never hear a child speak like that at all. And I'm absolutely certain that it will. Well, within 20 years, it'll only be found in books and perhaps the odd recording of someone like me or other people to whom you can listen and hear it. Have a little break. I think the thing to do now, having been very briefly through my life, is to compare the radical changes in life from 60 to 70 years ago to now. And when I watch the children in Cavendish School playing on the green and I compare them with my childhood, what did children do in a Suffolk village 65 years ago without radio, without television, without gramophones, without any of these sophisticated gadgetry that entertain children today. We walked. We walked miles into woods, through the fields. We birds nested. Now I know today that is illegal. You must not interfere with birds nests or take eggs. But as children, we especially in April, went looking for moorhen's nests because if you found about eight eggs in a moorhen's nest, they were good for breakfast. And I have come home on more than one occasion with my pockets full of moorhen's eggs and my mother would cook them for breakfast for the family the following day. If we found pheasants or partridge nests, we were well aware that we must not interfere. We might have told my father, and he would say, well, you keep away from that, leave them alone. The reason being, of course, that the farmers and people who lived at Kentwell Hall and elsewhere wanted those pheasants to hatch and become birds for shooting in the autumn. What else did we do? Well, there was very little else to do at all. When the floods on the meadows were frozen, we went sliding. Those fortunate few 
who had skates could skate, but mostly we slid, we made long slides on the ice and amused ourselves all day long. Remember that in those days fire in the house meant a coal fire and that was started each morning by lighting sticks and one of the jobs children had in the language of the time was, boy, go and fetch some kindling and make sure that's sair. Now that means go and fetch some sticks to light the fire and make sure they are dry. And where did we get the kindling from? Well, if in the yard somewhere there would be faggots. If there weren't any, you were given a sack and you went off up to the wood and filled the sack with sticks which were there to light the fire early in the morning. An adult thing which has changed out of all proportion is wash day. In my childhood, boy, fetch the water, boy, fetch the bath, get the mangle ready, light the copper fire. Oh my word, it started at six in the morning. Blue bags were essential, soda, long sticks of yellow soap, and Wash day went on right through until six in the evening. Scrubbing boards, soap sets, food took a very much second place. Woe betide the man who came home expecting an elaborate meal on wash day. He didn't have it. I turned the mangle. I helped to squeeze the water out of sheets. I had to help peg them on the line. There were no spin dryers, and it was sheer misery if it was weak, was wet, and the washing didn't dry. I compare it with today. The lady of the house comes down. She switches on the washing machine, presses a button, throws in a bundle of washing, slams the door, makes a cup of tea, and half an hour later the washing is done and it can either go in the spin dryer or be pegged on the line. Oh, what a lovely life ladies do have nowadays. My wife, who is sitting next to me, is giving me a funny look. I must marvel I live in a chalet in Cavendish. Centrally heated. We have a fireplace where we have a fire. We have, I think, all the sophistications of life, television, radio, all the books I can possibly read, comfort, good friends, and really we live a life of great comfort. We are well. If we are ill, we have a doctor's surgery just down the road. We have four pubs in Cavendish, which seems to me an extraordinary ration of pubs, but there we are. Uh, we have shops, and if we should be without a car, we have probably the best rural transport in Suffolk. There are 11 buses a day to Sudbury or Haverhill, which means that uh, you can catch a bus to either of those places to do your shopping if you can't get what you want in Cavan. There are still a few people in Cavendish who are, like me, well versed in Suffolk dialect. But I think now Cavendish has a larger number of newcomers, people who have moved into the new houses and go to work, Bury St Edmunds, Colchester, Sudbury, Braintree and London. And yet, when I was a boy, in my village, and at the same time in Cavendish, 95% of the men, women and children in those villages worked on the land. And harvest was the be-all and end-all of life. Today, harvest takes place with great machines and we are hardly conscious of it except when the combine or the tractor slows us down in our cars. But it goes on in the fields without 
most of us being involved at all. Now, now at the end of the story, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the lady who was the girl I married in 1943. She was the girl who came from London to the primitive life in a Suffolk village and what looked after me <laughs> and has been my companion for 47 years. Look at the lens. <laughs> and does my washing now in the washing machine. Yes. It's taken the combined efforts of Mr. Hasty and myself to get her to appear at the very end. <laughs> My name's Doug Mallet. I was, I was born in uh, Essex at Thunderslea. I mean, I, I think my father moved to the nearer south end in about 1923. But the first recollections I can really remember was about the, the first, was, was the first of January 1930, and my father was talking to Archie Brown, the miller at Rayleigh, and he said to Archie Brown, pointing at me, he said. Well, we, that boy's bred to finish the war that we didn't finish in 19, the 1914-18 war. And there's a funny thing happened later on in life. I served in the war, in the RAF, in the Far, or in the far East mostly. But poor old Brown, my mother wrote to me in 1944, sent up the South End Standard in 1944, which got to me in Singapore in 19... 45, 46. Anyway, the war was over then. And old Archie Brown, his, who'd been a bit of a pig of a man, his, his son blew him up. Unfortunately, he'd been in the army, was on leave, and uh, this, this old Archie Brown had a stroke. And he's still carrying on, well, the business was still carrying on, the millers. But um, this lad, it, could, it was upset the way Archie treated his mother. So he was an e explosives expert in the army, and he and he, um, he set a mine on this pushchair. Unfortunately, he killed his father, but it blew the leg off the poor nurse that was killing, pushing him. And that was up at the tree. The, uh, the girl's leg was up in the tree at Rayleigh Rectory. So I'm told. Anyway, soon after that, I came back. I got relief. Well, I got. A, uh, what they call a Class E release from the Air Force and, and uh, came home home to um, back to England. I got this release because I was connected with Market Garden, but I didn't really want to come out of the rap, but my father had been a sick man ever since the First World War. And I thought, you know, better come home and carry on, but you always see it afterwards. It, it was, my brothers were running the business then, so really they could have coped quite well, you know. Anyway, we, we got on and we prospered quite a lot. And uh, when we were into mushroom growing in 1950, we went into the year I got married, we went into growing mushrooms quite successfully too. In fact, we developed the present day casing, what they call the casing, you know, which the mushrooms actually crop on. Anyway, when my father died, there was three of us in the business and uh, we couldn't develop quick enough and my wife didn't like living on the nursery. So I came to Suffolk. We took a pub, took a pub in Cavendish, the Cavendish School. Um, and Mr. Harold Ward from Foxer was the governor then. He, very nice man, old Harold. Got on well with him, but unfortunately they, they sold out to um, one of the London brewers, Taylor Walkers, I think. And uh, from there on we went, I think I was under five different brewers till I came out in 1970. But uh, I had a good time. Uh, my twins, my, the two of my children, my the twins, they were born at Cavendish Bull. And they're the only children within living memory. And that's going talking about people in 1956 when they were born. Who were, you know, were in their 80s and, ne and couldn't ever remember any children being born there. Like old, the late Vic Savage and uh, Tom Wells and people like that. But they couldn't remember anything, and they knew what they'd had history from their fathers. So I don't think it was any children 
going there for generations. Anyway, they're hale and hearty now, fortunately. All grown up, and I think they're, they'll be um, 34 at the end of this month, the twins will be. Anyway, um, a pub life is not, not much of a life. I was a village postman as well, but it didn't suit me at all being a publican. I could do the job all right, but I didn't like the tie, you know. It wasn't like being a green grass weave or a florist or something where you can go up to Covent Garden and buy your gear and have a deal, but you can't do that in the pub trade. You're tied for everything. Well, you were in my day. It's quite a nice job, but I didn't particularly like it. It drove me to drink events anyway. Anyway, it broke my marriage up and um, I was divorced in 1970. Virtually the day of, I got married. In fact, I got I was married on the 14th of uh, February 1950. <laughs> and got the divorce papers on the 14th of February 1970. And I thought that was pretty good timing, really. Anyway, my, 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 I, my wife and I are still great friends, actually. And she, we've, we seem to have prospered a lot better since we've been divorced which is a good thing. But um, it's uh, one of those things, you know. I think I must have been alone, because at the times during the war, I was very often on my own, out in the jungles. And you're frightened, but you get frightened with all sorts of things in life. But um, I didn't get lonely. I could never understand that. I've been with nobody under just the natives, or with Indian troops. And sometimes where, where, I, where there was very little English, you couldn't speak any English, and I couldn't speak much of their particular dialect, these particular truth. But there's one thing I never felt lonely. I've, I, I'm saying one of these people that like, come, like people, I, I could get on well with people in the pub trade and whatnot, but it's never been essential to me to live with people. Although I have plenty of good mates, you know, like everybody else. But I suppose it's, you know, it's the way you're made, you know. People said to me I could never live on my own. Couldn't cook for themselves, couldn't do this, couldn't do that, but I couldn't do it. Don't really mind it at all. I'm getting a bit dry. Good. Fourteen and a half years in a pub, in the same pub, is a long time. And you see a lot of things. My, 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 um, as I said, my twins were born there, and I already had a son, Robert. I was uh, two and a half, I think, when we went when we got, he came to Cavendish in 1955. And uh, the big thing about it, uh, we, we went into bed and breakfast, which was coming on a bit, you know, in those days, mostly for lorry drives and workmen and whatnot. But it gave us uh, a standard of living, a good standard of living. I, I, my, my wife ran all that, and she had, ran it completely. She had the capitalisation of it and the profits as well. But uh, it certainly gave us a good standard of living that we wouldn't have had just from the pub itself, from the beer trade. Don't think we'd ever stuck it. And it, uh, so it meant that when the children were growing up and uh, wanted to go abroad on school trips and whatnot, uh, at least we could afford to do that. It was quite an expensive operation really. So that was one asset, but apart from that I, I, I wasn't uh, very keen on it, although we had lots of funny things happen and lots of fun, you know, so lots of good people. There was old Bonnie, Bonnie Barnes, who everybody who lived in Cabinet to remember him, at my age anyway. Great man, uh, worked on a farm, mostly on the farms all his life, and always got a gun and always, <laughs> and always got something in the fridge or in the, hanging on a hook in the hole, always got a pheasant or a rabbit. Uh, a good old boy, and then there was another one, old Buck Schemer, and everybody who's, who's in the building trade and with the engineering told me it's one thing about old Buck, if you want to work, a worker, you've got a man to do it, a good labour, and, and they, they tell me they're very rare, but he was a bloody good old boy. Liked his eye and always got a laugh, got a spark in his eye. In fact, I very often think of the man, I see his grandson, Oh, some of his, a lot of his grandsons, and I often think to myself, those boys are workers, they take after their old grandfather. No doubt about it. But when I came out the bull in 1970, I, 
I didn't really know what to do. I thought I'll go back on the trade, in the trade as a salesman. Cause I, I'd always been a salesman in the nursery business. I was the one that went out and sold the stuff. But uh, <coughs> of course, after so many years off the road, I, I, I'd lost it all. I didn't want to do the driving. And anyway, they didn't want old men. So I went to work in a factory. I thought to myself, I'd never be able to stick this. And I was topping and tailing little bottles down at whole, whole packs, dent the fries bottles or something. They put dent, um, stuff for false teeth in anyway. And I was sat there pulling the tops and t topping and tailing this stuff. And I thought, Christ almighty, I ought to be able to do this. I, when I was about 12 years of age, I could pluck 10, ten chickens an hour if they weren't too, you know, too penny. <coughs> so it's the same. So I thought, by Christ, I'd be able to do this, and I could, it's a piece of cake. bit monotonous, but there you can always sit and think and dream and do the work at the same time, which unfortunately a lot of blokes didn't seem to be able to do. They found it boring, but I didn't find it particularly boring. I just, plenty of other jobs I could have thought would have done have been a lot better, but the money was good. And uh, I just got on with it. And then I went to Addis. Now that was, that was a, 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 probably the best place, the best people I've ever worked for. The Addis Wisdom Toothbrush Company at Haverhill. Now that was very, very good. I never thought I'd ever want to work in that Haverhill because I used to go there quite a lot at one time. But I got to know quite a lot of people that worked in the factory there and they were bloody good people, very nice, hard working. But they worked to a book of rules there and they were a happy lot. But the book of rules was made out in a 1874, I think, when Addis started, and they still kept to it. So you, you really worked for the money. But you didn't get all the moaning that I used to see when I went to Lucas, events at Sudbury, CAV, where blokes only worked about four or five hours out of ten. And they were always on the moan because they, they weren't pulling their weight, whether they were subconsciously ashamed of themselves or what, I don't know. But they were, they're the people that always moan, not, not the people that do the work. The ones that are always scrounging, that seems to be me, the way I think about it. Anyway, I worked for CAV for 13, just over 13 years, and I, I got on quite well. In fact, I had a, quite a good job in the last five years of my life. Comfortable, clean, and I worked at it because it was interesting for me to do, but um, I, I'm i glad I worked there because it, it, at least I, if I'd have worked a bit longer, I'd have got a bit bigger pension. But at least I'd get a little bit more of my old age. pension. Now I'm retired, which I did in 1986. And now I live up here at Hyde Park Corner. Now it's the best place I've ever lived in, in my life. I lived in a palace in India, which was good. But this for an old man is just right, nice and compact, central heating, good bathroom, good kitchen. I do all my own cooking. And uh, it's just right for an old man. Well, I hope I can live to lot as long as I'm pretty healthy, live till I die. <laughs> How about that? I'm Harold Cooper. I farm at Hill Farm Guestingthorpe in conjunction with my son Ashley. <coughs> I was born at Manor Farm Elmset in 1918. My father had been farming there for, se for several years. The family had moved down from Cheshire to Elmset in 1906. I went to a little private school at Hadley for a few, uh, at, Sud at Seema for a few years before moving on to Sudbury Grammar School. And I happened to be one of the last boarders at Sudbury Grammar School. There were 10 when I was there, and uh, I think they ceased when I left in 1932. I'm very proud to be wearing tonight, which you can see this Sudbury Grammar School old boys tie. And you do occasionally see one or two of these in Sudbury. I was brought up uh, in the farming life, <coughs> which 
was then in the absolute depths of the depression. Farms were then beginning to go derelict from 1929 onwards. I left school at the age of 14 because I don't think there were enough fees to keep me there any longer. Things were in a very, very depressed state. And my father had purchased another small farm at Oldham called Frog Hall and most of that went out of cultivation. Coming on to the war years, everyone had to register for national service in 1938, and I always wanted to fly, so I joined up immediately, and uh, one then could either join or, or they could volunteer, but there was conscription also. If you volunteered quick enough, you avoided the conscription. And I volunteered for the Air Force, and I was accepted. I had previously, in 1938, started flying lessons at Ipswich Airport, and in July 1939, I obtained my pilot's license. Going back to the flying again, during the years 1935, 6 and 7, I had tried to make an aeroplane myself and I had got this machine so that it would taxi along the ground but my engine was not quite powerful enough for liftoff. So I was greatly rewarded when this government scheme started uh, in 1930, at the end of 1938 it was and then I was able to learn to fly in 1930, summer of 1939. All the people after the conscription were in a category, all categorised as to what their occupation was. And as we at that date were farming and we were agricultural contractors, we, my call-up kept being referred back, pushed back six months, and then another six months, six months. We were the first people to use combine harvesters. We were the second farm in Suffolk to use a combine harvester. That was in 1936. We started then with crawler tractors in 1938. They were, that was a Lands Bulldog crawler. There were very few of these. They were made in Germany. And we were able then to mould rain and get uh, some land back into cultivation again because the wheat price had started to improve and there was a Wheat Production Act and people could see that we were heading for war so food production then became more and more important and I, as I said just now, uh, it kept getting deferred and deferred as far as my call-up was concerned. My father <coughs> was a very far-sighted sort of fellow and he purchased two TD-14 crawler tractors which were on a boat going to Norway when Norway was invaded and these two, the ship rather, was brought into Ipswich docks and my father purchased both these crawler tractors and throughout the summer or the remainder of 1940 because I think it was in May or June when these tractors arrived in Ipswich docks captured by the British as the Germans invaded Norway. We then started to expand this contracting business and I went out over into East Suffolk where I stayed with an uncle and my elder brother went over into West Suffolk and we were mould raining airfields and uh, helping the, the, the war effort all we could. We were walk, working almost day and night to get all the land ploughed which was derelict, all the farms which were out of cultivation. We were following the whole summer. We never stopped. We were ploughing every day from about mid-February right till harvest time, getting land ploughed for the following crops. In During 1942, the end of 1941, I purchased, or my father, with my father's help, purchased Fowers Farm, Belsham Otten. That was in Essex about four miles from Sunbury. And I had to uh, start off on that farm, which was almost derelict. There had been an attempt to get a crop off it that summer, the summer of 19, 
40, 1. And I had one bulldog tractor and one man there on 250 acres. And uh, you can imagine what a lot of hard work it was. The hedges were at tremendous height. The place hadn't been farmed for nearly 25 years, so it was completely derelict. When you went from one field to another, it was like a rabbit going through a tunnel because the hedges and trees met right over. So uh, most of the hedges were 20, 30 feet high. You, it's very difficult today to imagine what the countryside was like in those days. There were also hundreds of rabbits about all over the place, well, thousands of rabbits, and of course all those had to be attended to before we could grow anything. I purchased a combine harvester from Stoke by Nayland. Uh, this machine was pulled by a tractor, and uh, it is an International 31RW, a very advanced machine for its day, and uh, of course that was the only one in this area at that date. Quite a few came in the next year, but I think I was the first one to use a combine harvester in this area. That was in 1940, for the harvest of 1942. Quite a lot of new ones came in 1943 and those were the Massey 21s. When, uh, in 1945, I purchased Hill Farm Guesting Thorpe, mainly because I hadn't got a house to live in. The house on the foes had been derelict for 30 years nearly, and a lot of that is described in my son's book, The Long Furrow. Uh, Perhaps it would be as well if I picked that book up now, would it? Because I just want to mention... Can I stop there for a second? A lot of the early history of those years is recorded in my son's book, The Long Furrow, where he describes the... <coughs> two, I think, of the contributors to that describe the Foe's farm and the derelict state of agriculture during those years. In 1945, I moved up the hill farm Gestonfield because there was no house at the Foes. We had to live in a little house at Yeldon. And uh, this farm was for sale in 1945. We purchased this and we had a lot of uh, clearing up to do. This had been a dairy farm at that date with a milk round, but a lot of the land here was terribly sour and it hadn't had any chalk or lime and the crops were, you know, very, very poor indeed. We had a tremendous amount of work to do, liming, draining, and all that sort of thing. And it was during the summer of the following year that we were ploughing quite deep on a part of the farm when I was able to recognise fragments of tile which turned out to be Roman. Now, I wonder, shall we stop there now? The Roman site to me has proved to be my main life's hobby. And I realised when I had a Roman site that I had to do something about it. I did try to get the authorities, the archaeological people, to come and do an excavation here. But it was in 1948, not long after the end of the war, and uh, of course there was a tremendous number of bomb sites to be cleared up and all the archaeologists were working mainly on the, on the, in the cities where they were going to rebuild on top. So I uh, started to excavate slowly and I became very enthusiastic. During the winter I took a flight to Rome and uh, studied all I could possibly study in Rome and uh, Pompeii and places like Herculaneum in Italy. The following for the next 25 years or so, I had a fortnight's holiday somewhere in the Mediterranean area where I could study Roman remains, particularly in the south of France, in Libya, in Turkey, in uh, Italy itself, of course. Uh, and that was a great background for me. Uh, uh, <coughs> it was a great opportunity for me to delve into the background of the Roman civilization which was coming to mean more and more to me as uh, I slowly uncovered this settlement which covers about 10 acres. That uh, story is also described in this long furrow 
uh, the first or second chapter, I think it is. And Ashley has, my son, has, has made a very good job of that. But we are now in the process, or Ashley is, of writing a much fuller uh, account of the early excavations and continuing right through after the after we had to, we had to wait for the second and final uh, book or report on it because we had to wait for the official report which was printed in 1985. Can I just show that? Sorry about that. I hadn't got that one with me. This final report. I was very lucky during the early years of my archaeological work in meeting a gentleman called Jack Lindsay and he was a very very great scholar in fact he only died about a couple of months ago he was one of the type of people who he lived quite near at Castle Headingham and he was a fellow who was always in the British Museum or at Cambridge or somewhere like that and he was an author he had written many books and I was absolutely thrilled when he dedicated this book to me. And this is called The Romans Were Here by Jack Lindsay. And in the front he's written to Harold Cooper with thanks for initiating me into the local archaeology, Jack Lindsay Castle Headingham. That probably gave me a tremendous boost. And after 30 years of excavating here, this is the uh, report published by the Ministry of the Environment and it contains all the finds that have been made in, at Gestingthorpe here. And you can see some of that anyway. But this is obtainable in the public libraries. Uh, it's called the East Anglian Archaeology, Volume 25. And that is in Sudbury, three or four copies in Sudbury Library, Bury and all the local libraries. I was very lucky on several occasions with the archaeological work because I met some most interesting people. On one occasion, I had a Russian, Russian uh, professor <coughs> come and visit me. And he'd been excavating in Russia, and that was, uh, oh, about 20 years ago now, when uh, liaison between the British people and Russia were not too not too calm and uh, I gave him a Roman coin which I'd found and he then gave me uh, a nice little book on archaeology but of course it was written in Russian so <laughs> I couldn't read a word of it but it's a very nice thing to have uh, now some of the highlights of my archaeological work uh, some of the finds went up a lot of them went to the British Museum of course and the tremendous tremendous amount of research has been done on them and one of the greatest finds was the evidence and part of a clay mould in which a statue had been cast and I was so lucky in meeting the great scholar Professor Shepard Freer from Oxford who did all the scientific work on this clay mould and he could show that a statue of Bacchus, the god of wine, had been made, manufactured here at Gestingthorpe. And he states in the final report, which is published in Britannica, and in the, <coughs> which is, it, which is the, the main sort of archaeological bible, if you like, it's published every year. And he states in there that this is a unique find from England, and it is the only recorded place where these things were made, Gestingthorpe in Essex. Also, uh, I was thrilled to read in a book by Brown and Strong a description of bronze working in the world, and uh, early bronze working. And after uh, quite a, a page or two about Greece and the Middle East, they then mentioned that bronze casting was also carried on in the village of Gestingthorpe in North Essex. That meant a tremendous amount to me. Uh, now, I think I would like to show you one or two of the most important finds. Can we see? This is one of the complete Roman tiles.
which has come from the excavations, uh, you see a very, very heavy, nicely baked clay tile, tapered from about 10 inches down, slightly tapered the whole way, so that the next tile would fit in this end, and then they were covered by a ridge. It was these particular corners which first puzzled me, this recess here, because tiles have never been made like this in Britain. Although they were made on the continent, they were not made here. And of course it was finding small fragments of these that uh, first put me on the trail of this Roman work. <coughs> as well as finding pieces of tile, of course, I have uncovered several buildings. One very, very large building, which was 160 feet long, 20 feet wide, uh, the walls were three feet thick, constructed of flint, and there had been two separate central heating systems in it. One to heat the dining room, which had an apse end, a 20-foot 20, 20 apse end, and uh, there was a separate bath block in the courtyard, which had been underfloor heated also. Uh, it was a very large building, and very substantially built by these flint walls, three feet thick. About a, a 30 yards from that, from, from the very big building, we excavated a ditch which had run beside uh, a series of hutments or small houses in which carpenters had been working, cobblers, brick uh, pottery, uh, car glass making, bronze working, and all the little things that you would expect to be going on in a village. And of course it was in the ditch where children ha had been playing about with things where I made a lot of my best finds. A lot of the best bronze jewellery was found in the ditch. And there were uh, lots of ditches around the place because we must remember that this settlement was founded somewhere about 50 BC by Belgic tribes that had fled from Gaul as Caesar conquered Gaul and they had been in occupation here for anything up to a hundred years before the Romans arrived in 45 AD. The Romans quickly settled this part of England and things were peaceful for about 20 years. After the first sort of 20 years, the, the people of Norfolk rebelled under a queen called Berdicea, and they swept down here and destroyed Colchester, burnt St Albans, and destroyed everything that the Romans had started in this region, <coughs> particularly all the, the farms and that sort of thing. The Roman general was up in Anglesey at the time, Suetonius Paulinus. He came marching back very quickly, put the rebellion down, but the outcome, in the way that it affected our little settlement, was this. The Romans were very, very ruthless, and anybody that had taken part in the rebellion was put to the sword. Therefore, most of the able-bodied men, whichever side they were, if they went with Berdicea, then the Romans put them to the sword. If they hadn't, wouldn't join her, she put them to the sword. So we're left in the year 62, in the summer of 62, with a little settlement of women and children only. And the Roman government's policy was to disband soldiers after 20 years of service and send them out into the little villages and into the settlements, send the retired soldiers out to see after the women and keep the children, keep the settlement going. And the outcome was that, of course, the Roman soldiers were all trained people. They were all craftsmen of one sort or another, carpenters, blacksmiths, builders. They were very well-educated people. And they fused their culture onto that uh, of the people that remained here. And from then on, we call them Romano-British, half Roman, half British. And the settlement then here remained peaceful and quiet for the next 250 years. And great progress was made. Most of the people, I think, could read and write. I have quite a lot of evidence of that. 
They had a proper monetary system. I've been able to recover from the site 600 coins, or just over 600 coins. A lot of glass was uh, <coughs> was work. Uh, glass windows were in the houses. We've referred once to the central heating. We're quite sure that the agricultural system is so vastly improved under the Roman rule. We have got samples of carbonized wheat, which from analysis shows that the berries were quite as good as any wheat that we grow today. The yield wouldn't have been the same naturally, but it shows that the, the type of wheat they were using was very, very good. And we are growing some this year, uh, some Roman the same exactly that was growing in Roman times on this farm, just a little tiny row, one row only. And we hope to be able to make a loaf of bread next summer from wheat exactly identical to the wheat which was growing in Roman times. Now, as well as uh, the things that I have described, we have found a mass of things like hairpins, 150, I think, hairpins, some of bone, some of bronze, some of bone, bronze, silver, jet, and even a few of glass. A mass of pottery, half a dozen pots, complete, undamaged, unbroken, and uh, that tells us so much about what was going on and dating the buildings and so forth, because the Romans brought some very nice pottery with them when they came, and uh, imported quite a large amount of what is known as Samianware, from Gaul, from France, and a lot of that carries stamps, the name of the person who made it. And uh, the archaeologists are able to say exactly where this was made and can date that within a very few years. So all that's been a tremendous help. During 1985, the site was scheduled as an ancient monument. That means that uh, it is recognized as, as a, a valuable archaeological site. And I had a lot of help in publishing this report, the one you previously saw. Uh, I was able to, a young lady came down here, a scholar, and we were able to catalogue and tabulate everything. Everything was then taken up to London to the uh, Department of the Environment, Fortress House in Savile Row, where everything was drawn and every piece of iron had a little section taken from it for analysis. And I was lucky in meeting the scientific people uh, who were doing all this work. Many of them visited the site. And I, I'm correct in saying I think that this was the f one of the first sites to have all the ironwork analysed by new scientific processes which have only just been made available. Uh, there's two things which I have not been able to find on the site. One is the burial ground and the other is the water supply. I would dearly like to find where these supplies came from. The burial grounds were usually on roads leading in and out of the settlement and from the existing known Roman roads in the area, it looks as though a Roman road should run straight up from Braintree, straight through Gosfield, to the corner known as Folly Corner, Gosfield, and that's the southern end of the road from Chelmsford leading north. Then at Rodbridge Corner again, there is the end of a Roman road pointing south, and Gestingthorpe is in the centre of those two points, but no trace of the road can be found anywhere along the line. It should pass through Borley, it should pass very close to Smeatham Hall, and then to the Roman settlement, and thence through Maplestead to Gosfield. Uh, I think one of the reasons may be that the road was picked up in medieval days by women and children when the churches were built in the 10th, 11th century. Uh, there are 13 churches along this route. I think there are, uh, <coughs> well, there's Melford at the other end, of course, and then Liston, Borley, Bulmer, Belsham Walter, Gestingthorpe, Wickham St. Paul's, 
Maplestead. There's two Mapleston's and of course you've got Castle Headingham very near as well which would have taken thousands of tons of stone and I think this road was picked up by donkeys, uh, picked up by women and children using donkeys and pannier bags on the side of the donkeys. I think they would go and get a couple hundred weight of stones perhaps every every evening perhaps during the summer time and in that way our road has disappeared. It would have crossed the river somewhere near what we call Barford Bridge and I remember Charlie Gardner telling me about 30 years ago that when his grandfather walked to school from Borley when that bridge was built that's going back a bit the people building the bridge came upon a dugout canoe when they were digging the foundations for the bridge and it was so hard this oak dugout boat that they left it there they cut out a little bit on one side of it where they could get their bricks down and it's still there maybe 12 15 feet down in the bottom of the river now returning back to the site again or the history of the site uh, everything prospered until about the year 300 at Gestingthorpe and then a degeneration slowly starts to set in. The, it can be noticed quite definitely in the coinage which goes from coins on which you could read every letter. After about 340 or 350 the coins began slowly to sort of disappear and we have a lot of squiggles. There are a few good coins, but not many, and the coins is debased, it goes smaller and smaller until by 420, 450, the coins have disappeared altogether. And there's no... The last regular coin we have is about 395, and from then on, the next 50 years, sees the end of the Roman Empire, the end of the Roman culture in this country. It may have carried on for a few more years, but there's very, very little evidence. It looks as though writing and reading disappeared. It looks as though we were entering, and obviously we were, into the, what we call the Dark Ages. And from then on, we really know nothing. During the Roman period, we have quite a bit of evidence of writing and reading here. We had eight iron stylus, which I was able to recover from the main building, and several iron stylus from even huts and houses where poorer people were living in, because not all the people in this settlement were living in the big house. A lot of people were living in smaller thatched and possibly wattle and door buildings. One of the finds which I would just like to show you is this one. It's one of the tiles which was used in the central heating system. You see it's hollow for carrying the underfloor heating up the walls so that the walls would become warm in cold weather and someone had scratched on this tile a fish which was a Christian symbol. I've outlined the representation of the fish with chalk so that it can be clearly seen. You can see the tail on my right hand side here quite clearly. The tail of the fish and this is the head and this was a very early Christian symbol. And just as a sideline, this is the tile that was featured on the television program from Sudbury, from St John's Church in Sudbury. This is an iron axe, a chopper, something people would have to have. You couldn't exist in the ancient world unless you could chop wood or cut. You had to have every homestead would have to have a, a chopper of some sort. And this is a plowshare, very similar to the plowshares we use today. And this one had been laid by a blacksmith. The farmer had worn this plowshare up and he then laid another piece of metal or the blacksmith had on top of it so that it would be what we would call reconditioned. You can clearly see the hole which had held this plowshare onto the plough, and oxen were, were used probably for draught, as I don't think there were any horses used for draught at that date. We know the Romans were, were, were quite good farmers and good agriculturalists. Uh, we, they introduced us to the cherry, 
Uh, they brought that with them. They also introduced the pheasant. They did a lot of uh, drainage works. They understood the marling of land. That means putting clay or chalk, chalky clay, onto light sandy land, which was short of calcium. And uh, of course they were great experts at vines and the production of grapes. The, oh, they also introduced the turnip and not the rabbit. The rabbit didn't come till later. I'm often asked about that. Now, the rabbit didn't come till the, the crusade at the time of the 11th, 12th century, 13th century. Right. This is my wife who has uh, helped me throughout my archaeological work. She's been very patient when I used to bring home lumps of dirty pottery and everything into the sink. And uh, uh, she has also enjoyed the benefits of uh, visiting many, many Roman sites in this country and uh, when we've been on holiday abroad. I, th I think I said previously we've visited most of the Roman sites around the Mediterranean area. Quite right. <laughs> this is uh, a branch cut from a tree and this is the type of early Roman plough uh, which would have been used on the site. This type was used for anything up to 100 years before the Romans arrived. And of course, none, no wood or anything like that survives. But I have found the iron plowshares which fit onto the snap. <coughs> in the same way that our modern plowshares. I made this up really so that uh, when I was talking to the school children, uh, it, they would uh, understand what I was talking about. This plough took me about five and twenty minutes to cut down in the hedge and bring home. Right now. This is a large Roman millstone. It's upside down. This is the grinding surface. And this would have been turned by a long pole or a donkey walking round and round. This is, you can see, a, a very good one. It's almost new. I don't think it's hardly ever been used. And, of course, they did use other smaller millstones, which they turned by hand. The wives would use those in the kitchens. That's all I can say. Onwards, we have a variety of the natural grass wheat, from which uh, the Emma wheat that we've just looked at was derived somewhere about 2,500 years ago in the Middle East. This type of, of grass wheat grows wild in Syria, Persia, and the Near East. We haven't got a very good plant here, but we will not be able to tell really what we've got until it comes on here. Well, here we are at the Gestingthorpe Roman site. We're about a third of a mile up this uh, road from my house. And over here on the right hand, on the left hand side rather, were the main buildings. About 50 yards in here, we found the remains of the best mosaic floor. It had all been broken up in antiquity, but we could pick up many, many cubes off the surface. Down in the hollow stood the very largest building. That is the one which I described earlier, which was 120 feet by 60 and along on the edge of the slope there, on the far edge, on the, going slightly up, was the large ditch, and beside that ditch were the carpenter's shops, blacksmith shops, and the industrial bronze working, and things of that nature, as well as the cobblers and the leather workers. It was like the whole area was, or developed into, from pre-Roman times into a fairly largest village somewhere in the 300, 350s. And from then on, I think as I told you, it all started to decline. Over this region, we have recovered 400 coins off the surface and 250 in the excavations. And those range from 50 BC. We have four Belgic Iron Age coins and the rest are normal Roman coins, including almost all the emperors throughout that period. I think that's all I want to say about the Roman site at this 
point. We will now have a look round this side because this is the direction of what I believe to be the main Roman road through this region. It came up from Chelmsford straight through Braintree to a, a point called Folly Corner Gosfield where it just disappears which is five miles south from here. Now when we go north we pass through part of Bulmer and Borley and then on to Rodbridge Corner where there is another Roman road now. There was a crossroads in Melford. So we presume that this road must have gone through here. Where it has gone to and why it can't be found, I cannot understand. But evidence may turn up in the years to come. When the huge gas pipe was put through here several years ago, it crossed that line several times. And I walked the whole length of this pipeline to see if there was any trace of that Roman road but there just was no trace anywhere. It's one of the puzzles, but it would not do for everything to be plain sailing and easy, otherwise there would be nothing or no interest in archaeology at all. It is only the puzzles which are presented and the difficulty sometimes of finding something which uh, makes it a most interesting hobby. Now there's a two or three people whom I would like to thank. I would like to say a, a word of thanks to the late Mr. M. R. Hull or his family because he was the curator of Colchester Castle Museum when I started this work and he was an enormous help to me. He was a very kindly helpful gentleman. Also I must thank the family of Major John Brinson and he was president of the Essex Archaeological Society for several years. And he would come up and see me whenever he possibly could. He gave me much helpful and friendly advice and he would walk across this site with me and he would explain how things were and it was from him I did learn a tremendous amount. He was also instrumental in introducing me to uh, many other archaeologists and people who were interested in research. It is always the beginning, I think, the first step on the ladder, which is by far the most important. Also, I must mention my father. Although my father didn't do any archaeological work, he was a, a great scholar and he was very, very interested in history. Also, my grandfather and great-grandfather. My great-grandfather, I think, had almost a complete set of the classics and we've still got some of those even today. In the very beginning, I started to learn all I could and one day there was a salesman coming around with the Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, uh, that fired my imagination when I saw that there was a quite a lot about the Roman civilization in that. So I purchased that and it's been a very, very handy uh, document to me ever since. I think that's all I want to say now. Just. To I would just like to recap again about the p report that was published, the East Anglian, Arche Arche East Anglian Archaeology number 25, which most of the material in there is now 15 or 16 years old. And with uh, a lot of the recent finds, I'm looking forward to Ashley's publication uh, in perhaps two to three, year, three, four years' time possibly, when he is going to write a much fuller report of the work that's been done here and the surrounding areas. He's very, very interested in archaeology and we have there's quite a lot for him to write about, which has not been published, which throws new light altogether. Um.
Peter Brown. Uh, this, you are at the Bunting's Farm, which is the home of the fox over herd of uh, pedigree Holstein Friesians. Uh, the Foxhole Herd was established uh, about in 1967 at Brook Hall, uh, which was run by my father. Uh, he uh, bred pedigree red poles for 50 years before that, and his father before him. The herd was uh, then moved to here in 1967, and uh, it was set up on the green site. All the buildings that uh, here are new, uh, all built basically by uh, farm labour and uh, the herd. We're now in uh, Alf, the herdsman's house, and uh, we're watching the uh, monitor, which uh, has got two cameras over the carving boxes. Uh, you can see on the television there that uh, Alf has got two cows in the boxes there to demonstrate. Uh, this was installed last year to uh, help with the uh, carving of cows, so that uh, the herdsman can uh, watch and hear uh, his cows when they're due to carve in the boxes. In this building we've got uh, a heap of grass silage which was made about uh, a fortnight ago in this half. In the other half of the building we've got uh, brewer's grains which uh, have been ensiled uh, for the winter. There's uh, about 150 tonne at the back there, but uh, we've had to take a few more in because uh, we are so short of grass at the moment that uh, we're on uh, winter rations nearly. Uh, we're feeding brewer's grains and silage plus also uh, sugar whip pulp nuts for the cows um, at the moment because they're so short of grass. But uh, basically these grains are for feeding during the winter uh, to help uh, milk production and also they help uh, uh, the intake of silage. Uh, they've been installed in here, some salt sprinkled on the top and a plastic sheet put over the top and all the air trapped out. Uh, we take them in this time of year because we can buy them about £16 a tonne, whereas in the autumn they'll cost uh, anything up to £26-£27 a tonne. Right, this building has uh, been rebuilt this winter. Um, it was a replacement building for one that was mysteriously burnt down uh, after harvest last year, which uh, we don't know how it was burnt, how the, it was set like to, but uh, there was a serious fire here and uh, the whole building was burnt and there was about uh, 300 round bales inside. Now we'll go inside. In here we've got two small yards 
which uh, allows us to uh, do certain things with certain animals. In this yard here, we've got uh, six heifers. Um, we're playing around with those because uh, we're going to put uh, embryo transplants in them. This particular heifer here, this one here, uh, had an embryo put in at eight weeks ago, and uh, a fortnight ago she was confirmed in calf uh, with one of our own embryos, which was uh, taken from one of our own cows about 15 months ago, and has been frozen. And uh, we've lined her up as a recipient, and uh, the egg was implanted a week after she came on heat. Uh, they have to do that so that uh, because the embryo, when it's taken from the cow, is taken um, a week after it's been fertilised. And these other two here, uh, and that one there, are going over on Wednesday to uh, have embryos implanted in them. Now we'll move. In this yard here, we've got uh, 10 cows that uh, were dried off uh, about uh, five or six weeks ago and uh, we've been um, flattening them up on some grass until uh, today. Uh, we brought them in here today. Uh, we're lining these up for sale as cull cows. Um, cull cows sell quite well, provided you can get big heavy cows and uh, plenty of meat on the back end. These cows will sell for about, hopefully, uh, uh, the second one from the end there probably weighs about 700, 750 kilograms and uh, hopefully she'll sell for about 85 pence a kilogram. In this side of the yard, uh, we've got some uh, new cubicles. Um, the idea of putting these cubicles in here is that uh, we hope to train the uh, in-calf heifers next year, um, and bulling heifers, uh, so they have a winter in here. Um, these are just cubicles fixed to the wall, and all which we'll do is unravel our own bale of straw down this side here, and then we shall fork the straw into the cubicles so that there's only straw in the cubicles in this part here, and this part here will be a slurry area. Hopefully that will then train the young heifers to uh, lie between the cubicles um, so that when they come into the herd that uh, they won't have the stress of having just carved and also having to learn how to uh, lie in the cubicles. In here, you see the uh, automatic scrapers in the uh, cubicle house. Um, these move along very slowly and uh, scrape all the slurry uh, out of the cube patches here and also out of the feed patches the other side. These uh, work on a time clock and we can run them uh, as many times a day as necessary. We normally run them uh, winter time when all the cows are in here full time, probably about once every four hours. Right. Here you see the uh, outer pile of feeders. Uh, we've got one cow there standing, she's just backed out of the feeder. But if you look at it closely, you can see that uh, she has a transponder around her neck. But now she's just put her head in uh, that uh, records to a uh, computer which uh, then uh, works the local organ which runs very slowly which uh, will meter a certain proportion of uh, concentrates depending on uh, how much she's been programmed into the computer that she can have. Um, she's a cow that's carved fairly recently so uh, She'll probably be having uh, somewhere in the region of four to five kilograms of cake um, on the outer pile of feeders. The idea of the outer pile of feeders was that um, with uh, high yielding cows that they are giving uh, 40, 45 litres, it is very difficult to uh, get enough concentrates into them when you're, say, feeding on a regime of uh, maintenance and uh, 14 litres, um, they need to have somewhere in the region of 10 to 12 kilograms of concentrates for a 40 45 litre cow. Now, she can't eat that all in the parlour when she's being milked, so she can have it out here, probably goes, has to go in three to four times a day to get somewhere in the region of six or seven kilograms of cake. 
Here we see where the uh, scrapers end up when they come out of the building. Uh, you can see the grids here where the slurry arrives and the slurry falls through the grids and it is then uh, there's a channel runs right along the end of the building here and across over there to where that little uh, hut is uh, it is gravity fed on a step system and uh, there's a, a lip on each step so that the slurry floats down on water and it works very well without any maintenance at all and it ends up in uh, a reception pit over there before it's uh, pumped into the lagoon or goes through our separator. Right, slurry now ends up, uh, as you can see where that grid is over there, into that uh, big reception pit. Um, that little machine up there is a uh, uh, a stirrer, which uh, stirs all the uh, dirty water and the slurry which comes into there. Everything that's used in the uh, dairy, the parlour washing, the dairy washing, has to come up and end up in this reception pit. This uh, system has just been installed and it works uh, completely automatically on a time clock. We run it on a cheap rate electricity at night. Um, the yeah, stirrer starts up for about six minutes to agitate the, the pit and then uh, uh, it's done through a Ventura system, which is a pressure system, which uh, then sucks the stuff up through and into the uh, slurry separator, which uh, works on a very simple principle of uh, like a lot of brushes brushing over uh, a, a sieve. So it brushes over the sieve the whole time and the water falls through and the dry fibery material as you can see falls out the side here this is then uh, carted away and uh, it's spread as conventional muck the liquid can either then be put into the lagoon which uh, holds three quarters of a million gallons of water or else we can uh, put it into a pipeline and uh, irrigate it through a low volume irrigation system out onto the grass which uh, we have been doing just recently um, hopefully we, you'll, you'll be able to see this working later on now you're looking into the lagoon um, which you can see is uh, nearly full uh, this is uh, most of our winter supply of uh, dirty water and slurry um, this is, uh, hasn't been through the separator and you can see the crusty stuff on top. We have been taking some of this out of here, putting it through the separator and irrigating the dirty water down the field. The idea next year, hopefully everything will go through the separator so that uh, this lagoon will just be full of liquid and uh, there will be no crust on here at all and we should be able to irrigate it a lot easier. On. Now you're looking over the silage bunkers. Uh, this first one here was the uh, first cut silage which we're feeding at the moment because we're, as I told you before, we're so short of grass. Silage is a little bit wet but uh, that silage is about uh, seven weeks old from being made. There's probably about uh, 150, 200 tonne in that clamp. Uh, the next clamp over was the rest of the first cut silage. The whole clamp, when it's full, holds about 500 tonne. So well, we think somewhere in the region of uh, 400, 450 tonne in that one. And then in the further clamp, we have uh, some silage that was left from two years ago at the back. And uh, at the front was the second cut silage, which I think we probably made another 200 tonne, which might just about be enough to see us through the winter. The silage you can see is sheeted down tight and we covered the silage clamp with tyres because it traps all the air out and the idea of putting the tyres over so they touch one another is so that you don't get much waste on top of the silage.
In here we have uh, three, two more limousines and... Uh, in here we have five calves. These are probably about uh, eight weeks old and uh, they've just come off milk and they're now on dry food. You see the one over there, number 72, that's a, that's a young limousine calf. Um, these are all bull calves and uh, they will go down to the other farm, Brook Hall, where they will be uh, intensively fed and uh, fattened up. Hopefully uh, they will be ready for slaughter in about a year's time. We're now in the ox and uh, we'll just do a little bit on uh, breeding. Uh, we are using mostly uh, Holstein bulls, but uh, we're using Holstein bulls which uh, have a fair amount of confirmation and uh, are not too extreme. Uh, we have a fair selection. Uh, this bull here is uh, actually a red white Frisian bull from uh, Holland and uh, he is very good on uh, udders and uh, that's his strong point. This one here is a, a German bull and uh, he's probably a bit uh, Holsteiny, uh, a bit sharp, but uh, we have to be careful how we use that bull because uh, otherwise we become too extreme. This bull here, Felix, is uh, an American bull which has uh, been used a lot in Holland and uh, he's a triple threat son and we've used him over the herd quite extensively this last year because uh, he gives nice black calves and uh, being a triple threat son they have uh, nice wide back ends on them and uh, don't have the typical Holstein trait where they narrow in at the back end and uh, we just started using uh, this ball here called Starbuck. Uh, we bought some semen from him and uh, it's rather expensive and we have to be very careful how we use it because it's uh, 55 pounds a straw. So we don't want to use uh, too many straws on one particular cow, but we're using that on the probably the half a dozen better cows that we've got trying to breed probably uh, uh, something uh, really special. This bull here, uh, Hilltop Award, is a confirmation bull and he's been widely used all through the world and uh, he's also fairly expensive. We used him last year, we had 20 straws and uh, I think we've got three straws left and we managed to get 15 cows in calf. So we're quite pleased, especially as he cost £35 a straw. This is a little computer which uh, operates the outer part of these and uh, we can do many little things on this. Every cow which has a transponder is programmed into this computer and uh, we'll just uh, try and bring up a cow. If I tap these numbers like this, that's cow number 10 and uh, she took 3.3 kilograms of cake yesterday and uh, now we flick back and it gives us the time of day. We've got uh, the hours, minutes, seconds. We also have a little printer here which uh, will print out every day um, the amount of cake that each cow is allowed to take and then the amount of cake that the cow has taken, all in kilograms. The cow is allowed to take 50% uh, of the cake she didn't take on the previous day, the next day, but no more. And uh, this system works quite well.
This is the separator working. The liquid will be pumped out onto the field. course here working at Bunting's Farm from Riddle Agricultural College. Uh, we have to do a year on an outside farm uh, in the middle of our course uh, and I work here now until September when the next student will take over from us. This is the Star Valley. This is the irrigator, where all the surplus liquid comes to. If I can get too close, it's gradually pulled along by a wire rope. Pumped underground to 
the standpipes, which are placed at different points. Hello Tara. Cavendish in the distance. This is a standpipe out of the main. That is the main back to the farm. Standpipes at intervals.
Vauxhall Heard is, was uh, established in uh, 19... I'm Mr. Charles Gooch, born in Bury St. Edmund, Suffolk, on the 18th of the 7th, 1913. I was walking and talking when the First World War broke out. I can't remember anything until 1917, when the air raids were about. My uncle used to carry me on his shoulders down to the pub called the Unicorn, where about 40 to 50 people in the street went down the cellars to get away from the bombs. I started school on, in 1918 and went to the Eastgate Infants for two years. And then I went to the Guildhall Feffman Boys School until 1927. In 1926 I started work as an errand boy for a grocer's shop on Angel Hill, Barry St Edmunds, leaving school during school hours. During the general strike 1926 I worked for seven years there, then I was made manager of one of their shops, which I held for 18 years. I don't know what people would do today if they had to work from 8 in the morning to 6 at night every day to Thursday, Friday 10 o'clock and, and Saturdays 10.30. For, for Saturday 10.30 o'clock for £2 a week. My wife also helped me in the shop and got nothing for it. I married my wife on May the 12th, 1934, and up to now we are still together after 56 years of good married life. In 1940 I was called into the army and served in the Royal Norfolk Regiment and for six years. I came out in 1946 and went back to my old job as a grocer. In 1948 I wrote to Green King for an interview in regards to having one of their inns and my wife and I and myself had to go to the brewery and was told our news, uh, told our, our names would be placed in their book when we came up but had to wait till 1953 when they sent for me to go and look at Glimpsed Crown. Two weeks later we were told we had got the pub and would move in on the 24th of July 1953, for which we stayed for 26 years. When we re retired, my wife and I had 26 years, very happy. We had a very good trade and good lot of customers. Never any trouble, many coming from miles around. In 1956 I started a cribbage league called the Glemsden District as it was the only one in the Sudbury area. It took on well with 16 teams and it has no trouble in getting teams to join. It has eight trophies to play for and, and six are played for in different pubs in the league during the season. So each pub has a chance to sell a little more beer. I was secretary for 25 years and have been on the committee for 20, 35 years. Also played for Glimpsen Crown for 35 years. The league hold a dinner and dance at the end of the season where all winners receive their trophies. It really is a wonderful league. I also had a dart team which played in the Southern District League where we had some wonderful nights out playing darts. We had a lot of old, old age pensioners using my pub. In fact, it was them that kept the pub going in the mornings. They would all get in the tap room and talk some very heated, some heated at times about politics, farming, etc. They used to thrash and hold more, co more corn and sugar beet than the farmers grew. I, I used to sell pork pies, which I put on the counter. One night a customer came in and asked for a pint of bitter, which I had to go around another part of the pub to get. I don't know why I did it, but I turned round and in a glass I could see him putting two pies in his pocket. So when I asked him for the money, I also put the price of the pies. Of course he denied it, but in the end, after a lot of talking, he had he the old he had to put, he did pay up. He had he had me, but in the end he had me, and and he died owing me fifteen shillings. 
Dark matches are very, quite different today than they than what they were 25 years to 30 years ago. We always had a 32-seater bus filled up when we played away. We used to start out at 7:30 to arrive at about 8:15, get the match over, and as soon as possible, then it would be a sing-song with the piano playing till the pub shut. Today. They don't leave the pub till nine o'clock. I'll play their game and out and they're away. I used to grow four rod of dahlias flowers every year. I used to cut eight or nine bunches and place them in vases in the pub every day for about six weeks. And every night when I closed, there was never any flowers left. Customers used to take them or ask for them. And they were more pleased with them than if I'd give them a drink. I used to sell draw tickets for, for Cambridge United Football Club and after a couple of years they bought me a cup for crib, cribbage to be played for every year as a house cup. Customers of the pub playing for it and it is still played for today after 20 years. Every year the pub had three outings to the seaside. Dart team and cribbage teams went to Yarmouth and I used to give an outing to the regular customers to different places every year. There used to be free food and free pints of beer, per, per, four pints of beer per person. And there was always 70 people going. And although they got that all free, some of them used to rob me by filling their bags with bottled beers to take home. And then would bring the empty bottles back during the next week and wanted two pence back on the bottles. You know there is some funny people about. I also ran a raffle each week which 12, with 12 prizes of wines and spirits. And the money over went into a bottle standing on the counter for people to put the money in for old age pensioners for Christmas. And we used to buy 28 Christmas cards into which I used to put 10 pounds for every, for the 28 per pensioners. In every card we never lost a pensioner as a customer, they used to look forward to their Christmas card a week before Christmas and we used to get Christmas cards back thanking us and the customers for the money. I am now the ripe old age of 77 years thanks to my little dog who makes me take him out two or three times every day. Thank you very much. See you.